So, hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's quite an experience or to enter a stage uh, after an astronaut, I have to say, and we all are space geeks, so uh, it means something very special for us, especially and also in introduced or uh, into the topic. Especially also, as we will discuss about space and the threats we are facing, we would like to discuss with you space the next strategy, st tragedy of the commons. It's not a very comfortable topic, um, we have to say, but um, as Kenny just mentioned, um, it can be also the next hope. But let me thank the organizers, Alexandra Moritz, uh, Yossi, Border family, and all the wonderful people behind the scene to make this amazing conference happen, and also to have the courage to put us here on stage with this topic. I'm Thorsten Kreening. I'm the publisher and CEO of the Switzerland-based spacewatch.global, an online news portal and independent voice for global space. I would like to introduce my, my panel uh, a bit later uh, when handing over the mic to them. So, putting up. I assume you all used your mobile earlier today. Um, you used this the weather service to sneeze at snow rain outside, navigation services, or just made your phone calls. I would not expect that many of you thought about these common services have to do something with space. But mobile phones use space services, space-based services, synchronization services, weather data, GNSS, GPS, or Galileo services. Space become for all of us essential, even we don't know that. Space is commercial valuable. Space is a critical infrastructure. That is the first point we want to make. We all got aware of the pollution of the oceans, of plastic in the oceans. In space, we are facing a similar trend, and that one my panel will elaborate um, on later. But what is the big difference between space debris and plastic in the oceans? It is velocity and speed. Just a reminder for all of, of you are, that are not using or not working with the space uh, environment on a day-by-day -day base. Space assets in the near-Earth orbits are traveling with a speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour. What makes it are to about 8,000 meters per second. With a clap of my, of my hand, assuming that's one-tenth of a second, this debris, every object, not just debris, travels about 800 meters in a tenth of a second. So, why do I say that? Um, it is very important to see the dimensions we try to engage with. Um, the escape velocity of a bullet of an AK-47 is about 750 meters per second, a fraction of that. And I'm sure not so many of us ever tried to catch a flying bullet from an AK-47. The takeaways we would like to address here and to convey to you um, are the following. So the first one, space, is critical, commercial critical for us. We have to protect it. Space becoming highly congested. We have to define the rules of the road. And third, space is poll polluted with debris already. And so we have to take action to make space sustainable. It is my pleasure to welcome my wonderful panel um, Professor Mori Baja, professor at the Texas University of, at Austin, Harriet Brettle, a business analyst at Astroscale, Daniel Porras, a space security fellow at the UNIDIR, what is the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, and Dr. Regina Pelsos, a space situational awareness expert at the DLR Space Management. Without further ado, I hand over to Moriba. Hello. So, uh, good morning, everyone. And um, 
I want to say that I'm, I'm extremely excited to be with such fabulous uh, company here on stage and, and glad that, that you're taking some interest in this very important topic. So I'm just going to briefly give some ideas about kind of the complexities and, and some of the issues uh, that we're facing in space. What I'm going to show you is, uh, first is a video to kind of show you how this population started to develop. Everything from Sputnik uh, back in the late 50s all the way till today. And so we started with one object and we currently track about 26,000 things uh, ranging in size from a cell phone uh, all the way up to the space station. Uh, you, just, you just heard uh, Katie talk about that. And these are not uh, you know, uniformly populating space. We put things on specific orbital highways and I want you to keep in mind uh, these orbital highways. Uh, we, we heard earlier from this mathematician, Marcus, I believe, uh, that um, you know, space may be infinite, we don't know, but every once in a while you have objects that actually collide with each other and that's part of the problem, is that the population can, can grow on its own because things on these highways sometimes meet each other and bad things happen. Here's an example, uh, simulation also from analytical graphics between Iridium, which was a working satellite, and Cosmos, which was a piece of space garbage, and they actually met at the same place at the same time uh, in 2009 and created thousands of objects. This is happening, okay? These collisions take place. Things explode and become smaller things, and so, you know, what we see in the oceans in terms of plastics and that sort of stuff, we're starting to see in Earth orbit, and you can see how these things start wrapping around the planet quite quickly. Uh, so what we'd love to do is mitigate uh, the preponderance of this uh, debris because, as Torsten uh, alluded to earlier, there are critical service and capabilities that we depend upon every day that have to survive in this growing environment of more and more pollution. And we can't predict exactly when these things are going to happen. Uh, I told you we're tracking like 26,000 things. There's actually uh, many, many more uh, because there's a lot of stuff that we can't track. So, Think 26,000 things that we're tracking, out of the 26,000, about 3,000 of those things work, everything is garbage. So about 95% of everything that we can track is garbage. And uh, most of the stuff that we can't track uh, is also debris as well. One of the things that we created at the University of Texas at Austin is this uh, crowdsourced space traffic monitoring system called Astrograph that you can just uh, you know, Google and see on your phone at some point. But it gives you a combined understanding of where uh, all these tracked objects are located. But interestingly, you know, we have this new space race going on. Uh, you know, space is not just geopolitically contested, but commercially contested. And interestingly enough, there are regulations that talk about how to maybe launch things and get things on an orbit. But once you're there, you can kind of do what you want. And, and it's, it's a mostly unmonitored uh, environment. So, so imagine, Imagine that, that you can go and buy a car uh, and you only, you only get a driver's license to get on the road, but once you're there, you can just do whatever you please. Hmm. Not, not, do, doesn't make a whole lot of sense and you can see that, that eventually that leads to uh, some bad things happening. And so one of the things that we'd like to do as space becomes more accessible, as we can take advantage of it for commercial purposes, we need to think about long-term sustainability of that environment. I have some more bad news for you. I know that uh, you know, Katie said that there's, you, know, you can think about it as hope. We'll get to the hope part later, maybe during the deep dive tomorrow. But for now, let's talk a little bit about tragedy because I want to motivate your brains. But we don't even all agree about what's in space. Right now, if you go to the US Department of Defense and get their public catalog about stuff in space, this is the space traffic map that you get. But if you talk to the Russians, that's what that looks like. Let me show you that again. Guess what? Those things don't look exactly the same, right? So that's part of it. We don't collaboratively share all these sources of information either. In fact, here are four different opinions on one object. Here are four different people that say, I believe I know where that object is located. As you can see, those things aren't exactly on top of each other. And the difference in distances between those are, let's say, hundreds of meters. But the point is, is that if somebody says there's going to be a collision, there's five other people that says there's not going to be one. Who do you believe, right? So that's part of the problem. So I'm going to leave you with this quote, which is one of my favorite quotes, right? The problem with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. Thanks, Moriba. So one question, transparency in space, how can that help our problem? Oh, so you want me to answer that right now? Okay. So, yeah, so, so, so here's, 
So here's one of the things that I'm saying, right, is that um, one of the things that was brought up earlier in terms of, uh, you know, bringing technology to the world and, and people knowing what's going on is that, let's say, for instance, you know, India, they blew up one of their satellites last year. Uh, the Indians say, oh, don't worry, in 45 days, there are going to be no pieces of debris that are going to survive this, except that we have other sources of evidence that say we still are tracking pieces of debris from India blowing up their own satellite. Who's right? Who's wrong? The thing is, people are behaving in ways that aren't necessarily fully monitored, and we need independently verifiable and corroborated evidence of behaviors in space to make sure that we can hold people accountable, and that's the, that's the importance of transparency. Great. Thank you. So handing over to Harriet, please or tell us how we can clean up space. Very easy, I know. I, w I wish it was easy, Torsten. <laughs> All right, um, so hello everyone, my name is Harriet. I'm really thrilled to be here to, today to talk about uh, space debris with the rest of this fantastic panel here. Um, so I just want to remind, remind you of the three takeaways that Torsten kicked off this session with. The first is that we rely on satellites in everyday life. The second is space is getting crowded. You know, we kind of think of space being big, right? But the usable parts that we use for these satellites um, is finite. Um, and so we really need to act now if we want to address this issue head on and ensure future space sustainability. So that's where Astroscale comes in. Uh, we are a startup that was founded in 2013 uh, with the mission to support and ensure space flight sustainability for future generations. Uh, we now have over 100 employees in four different locations around the world, in Japan, which is where our headquarters are, uh, Singapore, the US, and the UK, which is where I'm based. Um, and we've raised $140 million in capital to date to support our mission. So when we think about tackling this question of space debris, uh, we really think about doing that from a number of different fronts. Uh, the first is developing technology, so putting it simply, we need to be building space sweeping machines that can remove the debris from orbit. We need to be identifying business cases that mean that we can commercially, in a sustainable way, support and enable this technology. Um, and we also need to be working across the policy piece to develop standards, regulations uh, and international frameworks that can enable um, these solutions to move forward. So just very quickly expanding on each of these, um, in terms of the technology piece, uh, this is something that the Astroscale is working very hard on. So uh, later this year, we're going to be launching the LCD mission uh, into low Earth orbit. So uh, LCD, as with all good space missions, we have an acronym, it stands for End of Life Services by Astroscale Demonstration. And the idea with this mission is that we're going to be demonstrating in space the end-to-end -end technology capabilities that are required to uh, successfully remove failed satellites from orbit. So this technology works using a magnetic docking plate, which requires that to be put on the satellites before they launch. Um, but we're also looking at ways that we can engage with governments and agencies to remove existing debris from orbit as well. On the business side, uh, essentially we are looking at being the vehicle breakdown service for space, right? And so what we're trying to do here is understand what kind of business models can you develop uh, in space that have already been used successfully for other industries in Earth. And I can touch on that a little bit more later on. And then finally, I just want to kind of highlight the fact that all of this has to be an international and collaborative effort. Uh, that's why I'm so excited to be here on this panel, speaking with you know, representatives from agencies, uh, industry, academia, um, across the piece to, to work together to, to solve this problem. It's not something that we can do alone. Um, and hopefully there's a lot that we can learn from everyone else in this audience and at DLD as well. So, thank you very much. So, what can we learn from other industries, from other tragedies of the commons when it <laughs> yeah. comes to debris? Sure. Space. So, I think one thing that, that maybe the, the space industry is a little bit naive about is we, we assume that space is special, right? That it's this kind of wonderful utopian society where we're going to go live on Mars and everything's going to be fantastic. Um, but I kind of say, you know, we're still going to be the same douchebags on Mars as we are on Earth if we don't do something different. Uh, and so, 
one thing that we're, I'm very interested in is, you know, what can we learn from other industries who have these problems? So, you know, what can we learn from the way that oil rigs are decommissioned? How, what can we learn from the, the ways that a nuclear power plant is safely brought to the end of its life? Um, there's lots of different ways that we pollute um, and contribute to these tragedy of the commons on Earth. And so how can we apply those tools, be it technology, policy, or business models, uh, to help solve the problem in space? Thank you. So with that, handing over to Daniel. So maybe you can put in the hope part, or addressing the hope part now. OK, is this on? Thank you. Uh, I just want to point out that douchebag is, in fact, a technical term that we use fairly regularly. Um, so as Torsten said, my name is Daniel Porras. I'm from the UN Institute of Disarmament Research. All of the discussions we've been having today have thus far been quite hopeful and very positive. So you're probably wondering, why is there a disarmament guy on the stage? And you know, what we've been discussing so far have been safety risks to space objects. Now, safety typically refers to unintended incidents, so things that nobody intended to happen. But as it turns out, uh, there are also security risks in space that generate debris, and that's intentional incidents that create debris. So why would anyone want to intentionally create debris? Well, as Torsten said, everyone in this room relies on space technology, satellites. Well, guess what? So does the military. In fact, the most advanced militaries in the world are absolutely dependent on their satellite systems. Nuclear technology, for example, a lot of the missiles that would get fired in a nuclear exchange are all controlled by satellites. The targeting, the early warning detection, the communications, all of this depends on satellite technology. So a lot of the militaries eventually said, wow, if people are using satellites to target us, maybe we should figure out how to target those satellites and deny people the benefits of using that satellite technology. Now, what are the two most fundamentally basic technologies that are used to take down satellites, the oldest technologies that we've been seeing? Well, the first one is based on missile defense. They're essentially just ballistic missile interceptors. We've seen these used three times in history, uh, once uh, in 1985, well, four times. Once in 1985, once in 2007, again in 2008, and most recently last year in March, uh, when India destroyed one of its own satellites in a demonstration of their own ASAT capabilities. ASAT just means anti-satellite. Um, the other type of technology that can create debris in space by physically destroying a satellite is actually what Harriet was just discussing. Co-orbital vehicles were originally designed by the Soviet Union to come very close to another satellite and then detonate. And the shrapnel from the detonation would destroy the other satellite. So one of the problems that we're seeing with co-orbital vehicles, which could be highly useful, they can be used to refuel, repair, or potentially remove debris, well, you can also remove functional satellites. And in recent years, we've been seeing that there are some concerns by various countries about these close proximity operations that nobody knows what they're doing. Are they spying on my telecommunications? Are they getting close because they're gonna use a harpoon to drag my satellite out of space? There are some very sensitive satellites up there that are doing things like early warning detection. If you start messing with somebody's early warning detection system, what do you think that person is gonna think? What do you think they're gonna do? that could lead to potentially an escalation that ends in a nuclear exchange. So that, that's becoming a real problem. But the debris that is generated just from testing alone could destabilize, in particular, the low Earth orbit, because there's a lot of trash that gets generated from this stuff. Now, again, Mariba talked about this Indian demonstration. It was carried out at about 280 kilometers in altitude. To give you a sense of, of uh, the, the altitudes we're talking about, the International Space Station flies at 400 kilometers. The trash that was generated by that demonstration, we're tracking it at over 1,000 kilometers. So that's definitely within the range of the International Space Station. And what we're seeing right now in relations between various countries, as I'm sure you can imagine, is that a lot of countries are gearing up to do this kind of stuff more often. Now, in the United Nations and in a lot of other multilateral arenas, we're trying to figure out, okay, how can we mitigate the, the devastation that could be, potentially be realized from those tests, just from the tests? And I have to tell you, things aren't going great right now because countries don't want to talk to each other. So I think one of the things that uh, an event like this is really good for is to spread awareness about the threat just generated by debris, and then we can also start talking about 
well, if we're already generating debris with accidents, do we really want to add on to that problem with intentional actions? I leave that up to you. Great, thank you. So, but one point to, to clarify, why do we need the UN, UNIDIR, UNOSA, whoever, for, for, for that process? I mean, can't we just give it over, or hand it over to the commercial companies like Astroscale? Because the commercials also polluting the space right now. True yeah. enough, but private companies don't tell the militaries what to do. Uh, in 2007, the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army, they were the ones that conducted uh, a test that really kind of kicked off what we are seeing now as a, a new space race with weapons. Um, nobody told the Indians that they shouldn't do it either. There were no you know, private actors who were involved in that, in that incident. So what we're seeing here is that it's a threat that impacts everyone, and so what we hope to do is to come to some kind of an agreement where everybody gets on the same page, but that is really, really difficult to do in this geopolitical climate. Great, thank you. And with that, handing over to Regina. Thank you so much, uh, Thorsten, and thanks um, to, uh, that you've put together this panel um, together with the usual suspects and some fresh faces. Um, so I, uh, my name is Regina, I work for the um, German Space Agency, DLR Space Administration, in the Department for um, Space Situational Awareness, or SSA. Um, we um, work at the intersection of policy and operations in the domain of understanding what's in the space environment, and we operate a SSA op center together into an, in an interagency approach uh, together with the German Air Force, um, where we try to understand essentially um, what is going on in orbit, how uh, the different kinds of objects that we have and how they're behaving. And this is what I want to inform my um, final remarks in, in this round. Um, so in order to um, both do the things that um, we, we want to do in orbit, but also to understand what's up there, we need uh, some kind of awareness of um, what, what is up there and um, what different objects um, do. So we do this by having uh, sensors, radar, telescopes, laser stations, um, that can detect and follow certain types of objects in different orbital regimes, so in different orbital heights, in uh, low Earth orbit, medium uh, Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbits and different kinds of orbits. So there's not just one space, but it's really it's really different uh, different stages that are utilized in different ways. So um, we use uh, tracking radars um, to um, track objects that we already have some knowledge about, and we use surveillance radars where we um, kind of build a fence where objects pass through, and then you can kind of count them, detect them, and uh, correlate them hopefully to other objects that you already know or discover new objects. And um, the, on the bottom right there you see our newest little edition called uh, uh, Gestra, it's a new radar, you can see here. And um, so this is um, just one type of sensor that uh, many uh, states who already engage in spacefaring activities use. So most um, major space actors who uh, operate their own maneuverable satellites or, or plan to move them, they also need a necessity or the capability to understand and to follow their own objects and to understand uh, maybe what's going on around them. Um, um, basically, once you've got uh, an understanding of different objects, where they are, what they do, you can feed this data into, into some kind of catalog and you can get an overall understanding of the so-called situation or a picture of what's going on in space. And derived from this, uh, you can do many different things. So on, on our side, for instance, we work very closely with other European member states for the, from the European Union uh, to federate our sensor technology in order to um, bring services to the European community uh, for collision avoidance when satellites collide, for instance, or when they have conjunctions, so you can avoid collisions. We also track re-entering objects for the re-entry service and uh, we detect fragmentations in this. We do this by federating our sensor capabilities that we uh, all of us have into a network called uh, European Space Surveillance and Tracking um, because nobody uh, can do it alone. It's only the largest space actors who have partially or, or almost complete SSA capabilities who can basically detect um, um, the, you know, almost everything that's going on up to a certain side, uh, size of objects in different orbits, but for, for most of us, we need to collaborate um, to put sensors in different places of, um, on the Earth to um, geographically distribute it in order to get this understanding. And when you have this understanding, you can't just, um, you know, take care of the so-called space traffic. That's also often um, um, an idea uh, that's being discussed at the moment, space traffic management or space traffic coordination. 
but you also need it for all the other use cases that my colleagues have described. For instance, you need a real-time understanding or some kind of tracking if you want to conduct operations such as on-orbit servicing or removal. You need it to detect debris, and of course you need it to detect the um, advent or the aftermath of certain events uh, that are not benign, and also to understand um, other events such as inspections or things that could be going on uh, in orbital um, different orbits. Um, and I think by now you've, um, you've probably shared our, um, the idea that uh, space as a dual-use um, technology, many things in space can be used for, for different purposes, both on the civilian and the, and the military side. Um, we have this spectrum of safety and security that I think came out really well in this panel. So safety applications from risks and threats that are natural or part of the complex systems that we up operate up there, and security um, risks and uh, incidents that are more intentional and that we need to understand and, and prevent because of the implications. And one of the ideas that uh, gains a lot of traction at the moment is to, you know, is resilience, which we know from many other domains, um, the idea of, you know, providing a reliability on this intersection of safety and security, maybe also deterrence, depending on you, who you talk to, um, for, for this domain. And, um, in the future, this is going to become more complex than, than ever. So we are currently living in a un, time of unprecedented change um, for the orbital environment, but also for the ground-based infrastructure that we uh, have to operate in orbit. Um, I'm just outlining um, some, some trends here from you know, a multitude and multiplication of assets. They become smaller and smaller. They become aggregated into so-called mega constellations or large constellations of uh, dozens, hundreds, uh, even planned thousands of, of uh, satellites. But one of the points that is uh, really interesting is the, is the first tr um, trend up there, which is a, a growing diversity and heterogeneity of different actors who engage in the space domain. So it's not just the classical Cold War powers of uh, major spacefaring nations, but there's a huge amount of private, um, private actors, state actors, um, academic and, and research um, institutions, even private citizens who engage uh, in space in some form and who develop the necessarily ground infrastructure. And with this, I, I want to um, ask, a, a, yeah, I have a parting thought. So um, we all look at space um, from different perspectives. Some of us see it as a global commons, as a sanctuary that we want to protect from our own activity, but also from you know, uh, general threats um, for the future and an idea of sustainability. We see it also as a very practical place to put infrastructure for assets that we use every day for position navigation timing, for communications, um, for Earth observation, of course. Um, others of us see it as an operational domain, like the land, air and sea, in a kind of increasingly in a warfighting um, um, domain. And of course, we can all see if we, if we look at uh, space debris and a potentially cascading effect of lots of objects colliding and colliding with even more objects, we could see it as an existential risk waiting to happen. And uh, my final question would be for all of us, do we as these diverse actors actually share the same interests in safeguarding uh, space as a domain. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Just revert this question to you. What, is your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so, are we all share the same interest in it? Um, no, I, I would say that we don't share the same interest, which could be quite natural because we all quite we come from different uh, um, um, corners of you know industry and academia and, and different agencies, different state actors. But I think most of us also don't share the same um, fundamental values about the systems that we want to put in place uh, in, in orbit or how we want orbit and different orbital regimes to develop or space in general. And um, I think for now, the only thing that we can do is to, I mean, understand more about the space environment, talk to, uh, to each other much more and recognize that we have really different reasons to be in space and to utilize and explore space and try then to gradually uh, reconcile um, these interests. Thank you. With that, I would like to open our this discussion to the entire panel. So, taking the same question, so do we share um, all the same interest? Daniel, if you want to jump on it. I would say that at the moment we definitely do not. Uh, there are certain countries who see outer space as being um, an area that they would like to dominate. Uh, they see a lot of economic and security value and they would like to 
um, perhaps limit who can and cannot enter the, the space domain and, and carry out certain activities while they continue to carry out some of those same activities. Um, and then there are other actors who are strictly concerned with using space for economic purposes. Um, other countries are what I like to call space beneficiaries. I don't think there's any country in the world that doesn't benefit from space capabilities in some way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't necessarily have an interest in deploying weapons in space. Mm -hmm. So, especially at the, at the United Nations level, how do we bring these interests together? What are some of the areas where our interests converge? Uh, and that's mostly what my job is, is to try and identify those areas. And space debris is certainly one of them, because the trash does not distinguish between satellites. It doesn't care if you're an American, or if you're uh, Chinese, or if you're an Ecuadorian. It will hit your satellite and cause problems. And, and that can have very uh, significant knock-on effects. Okay, Harriet. Uh, I just want to add on a kind of Funny is probably not the right word, but interesting anecdote, kind of building on what Daniel was saying. Uh, a fair few years ago, there was a French satellite that was hit by a piece of debris, um, and the, the French space agency wanted to find out who was responsible for damaging their satellite. So they did a lot of work. They assumed, well, you know, Russia and America are the largest players in space. Presumably, it's one of their, their faults. Uh, they did the work. They looked at tracking the debris that ultimately caused their satellite to fail, and it was from a French rocket body. So, uh, <laughs> so there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done to you know even have the data to be able to answer these questions, right? Um, and what you were saying about you know the involvement of the UN, we have the UN's uh, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which has you know hundreds of member states uh, contributing to you know looking at how we can find common ground on these problems. Um, it's not easy, but it's reassuring to see you know sustainability guidelines being presented from the UN to try and incentivize this responsible behaviour. Maria. Yeah, I think um, you know from from my perspective, I see. A lot of people in this room, and I wonder how many people in this room recognize how important space capabilities are to your everyday lives. And here's the other thing I don't want to say. We, you know, earlier people spoke a lot about the internet. The internet itself is going to be a space-based thing, right? You have several companies, SpaceX, OneWeb, others that want internet to be space-based, okay? None, there's nothing protecting any of these satellites from loss, disruption, or degradation. People say, do we have shared interests? I really want to think about the voices of indigenous people. We, we heard about indigenous people before. There's this thing called traditional ecological knowledge. Dare I say, people uh, have thrived for thousands of years on this planet and know what it is to be in balance with an ecosystem. We don't have this sort of vision to that level in space. Even people that are on the ground that don't necessarily interact with space have a care for space. The reason I got involved in space is that I used to be enlisted in the Air Force. I used to guard nuclear missiles in Montana. I had to actually look at where Montana was when they told me I was going there because I had no idea. And it's a place that has a lot of dark skies, very dark skies. And the thing that got me interested in space is that while I was on duty at night, I'd look at the sky and I'd see dots of light passing over. I'm like, what is that? That's not a plane. It's not a, a, a meteor. What is that? Wow, human-made objects in space. Guess what? You can go to very dark places, and indigenous people don't have the same sky they had 2,000 years ago. The stories that they tell each other are not affected by the fact that we have this infrastructure of all these dots crossing the skies. Even they are impacted. So the thing is, everybody has a stake in what happens in space, and that's exactly why we're here having this dialogue. So the theme of these year's DLD conferences, what are you adding? So when, we, when, when you can make a statement, what could our audience add to that? How can the audience can be engaged with us? Who should take actions now? I think um, one, one thought that is, um, especially when you think about the space ground segment, what's on the ground, so you don't necessarily need to launch a satellite or have a payload up there. Uh, to, to engage with space. I mean, there's tons of space data that we can use, Earth observation data that you can build things off. I mean, especially the European Union has a huge wealth of Copernicus data for Earth observation, for instance. But um, 
I think especially with the, with the ground segment, it becomes really obvious now that even those actors, state and private actors who don't have a um, direct uh, stake in, in orbit, they have something really interesting to bring to the table in terms of um, uh, geographical locations, in our case, for instance, for sensors, to, you know, to have uh, things that we can, we can map from certain locations that we otherwise couldn't, or they have amazing um, software capabilities, or they just have really um, like, a, like a workforce that's really interested in this domain and uh, you know, is, is highly qualified for, for, certain, for certain work, such as, I don't know, astrodynamics or mm. um, even space law, you know. Um. For me, you know, it's fascinating to see this world where we're becoming a lot more conscientious about climate change and about how we're impacting our environment. I think one very useful thing to do would be just extend that a little bit. It doesn't have to be just climate change. It's, it's a full environmental impact, and we're also impacting our orbits. So uh, simply by recognizing that and trying to focus a little bit more on, on the impact that we have on our limited orbital resources, that would also go a really long way towards uh, improving these discussions. Yeah, and I think just to add on that, one challenge we as the, the space industry or space community have is making this issue real for people. You know, if you walk down the beach and you see plastic on, you know, in the sand, you can immediately see, you know, the impact that that's having on the environment. Now, uh, if you have a collision between two satellites or, you know, the threat of that debris getting worse and worse, you're not going to realize that that's an issue until it's too late and those services are gone, right? So I think one question that I'm particularly interested to get from this conference is, you know, how can we engage with other sectors, other communities that are dealing with environmental challenges? How can we make that real for people in the day-to-day? -day? And what are the technologies, policies, and business models that we can bring from other areas to help try and solve this problem? Ruba? Yeah, I mean, you know, just to extend on what Daniel was saying, I mean, I met, uh, you know, Al Gore at the TED conference in Vancouver this, this uh, past April, and I brought this up as near-Earth space is in need of environmental protection. And it was like people in the room that were all into, you know, the climate change stuff, well, how is space debris, you know, contributing to climate change and, and, and all this stuff? And I said, so where do you think the data to monitor climate change actually comes from? You know, it's, it's people need to realize a lot of what we use for weather, climate change, all these sorts of information are space-based capabilities. So whether you, know, you realize it or not, you know, we're here to tell you space is part of a global infrastructure in our knowledge base, and that's not gonna go away. To, to give you a sense of just how important it is, the United Nations has these uh, sustainability development goals, and they have all these metrics to track how we're doing and achieving those goals more than 60% of those metrics come from space. Great, as we are running out of time and I promise to be on the spot because we are in Germany, um, I just want to rephrase the, the takeaways are for, for, for you here um, that you take from this panel, if nothing else, then space is commercial critical for us and we, you have to protect it, um, or we all. Our space is becoming highly congested, as said earlier, and we have to define together these um, rules of the road. And if we have government officials here, please take your actions, uh, because they are needed. And the third one, space is polluted, and we, have, we all have to take our actions here. And we need you to support us. We need your input, not as space geeks, coming from all the other industries that are depending on that. So. It's nothing more here what we ask you to support us to uh, save life on Earth, because that is what it's all about. If you want, if we sparked your interest and you're still in this, oh wow, there is some hope. If, if you have seen it, great. Um, if you want to hear more about it, we have a deep dive session tomorrow at 10.30, so after breakfast, after the big party, so 10.30 is not so bad, uh, for one hour in the steel, Launch, oh, steel case launch, thank you. Um, and you're highly invited to sign up for it. Space is limited, but you can, it's, it's really your time with us to ask us questions and we try to be as open as, as possible. With that, um, oh, well. I would like to thank my wonderful panel, um, Dr. Regina Pelzos, Harriet Brattle, um, 
Daniel Porras and Professor Moriba Jha. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for listening to us and to yeah, make a dive into our world. Thank you very much.